50 years back, when I was doing my DM in PGI Chandigarh, the professor of hepatology then asked for a special endoscopy department with all the endoscopes. The conventional gastroenterologist administrators were aghast that how can a hepatologist ask for an endoscopy department? And because he was a fighter, he finally got the department with all the scopes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this person was Professor Jang Bahadur Dilavari. He was a visionary because 40 years back, he knew, he knew that there's a subject called endohepatology, which we've just come to know of now. So this, what has happened is over the last five years, there's been a dramatic improvement in techniques and technology of endoscopic ultrasound. And this has resulted in endohepatology become a separate specialty by itself. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes, maybe 15 minutes, is to try and give you a 30,000 feet view of what is happening in this area. Predominantly how endoscopists are now becoming a very strong component of hepatology and how either endoscopists have to become hepatologists or hepatologists have to come back to endoscopy for this specialty is growing so rapidly. So you have a whole panorama of things that can be done and that are done in this area. So what we can do using an endoscopic ultrasound is actually assess the liver fibrosis very well because we know the ultrasound techniques and the variety of them which can be added on to endoscopic ultrasound we can do very good liver biopsies, assess gastric and esophageal viruses, treat them with coil and glue, which we are not able to do earlier, especially the coils. And of course, do targeted therapies for HCCs in difficult positions, which uh, percutaneous or radiologists can't. And of course, in future, hopefully treat NASH and uh, create portosystemic shunts. So these are a variety of things that we as endoscopists can do. So let me start first with liver biopsy. Conventional liver biopsies were done percutaneously. And then, of course, in those in this contraindication in terms of ascites and so on, a uh, coagulation problem was transjugular. But increasingly now, there's a shift towards endoscopic ultrasound-guided liver biopsy. Now, percutaneous is standard, traditional, inexpensive. But one of the most important problems is the terrific discomfort that these patients have. In fact, if you look at most of the studies in hepatology looking at paid liver biopsy samples to see the effect of a drug and so on, in majority of the cases, they're not been able to complete the study. And the reason is the second liver biopsy is often refused by the patient. This is because you're going to the pleural surface, they have pain and so on. So this has become a problem. Of course, transjugular can be done, but transjugular has certain disadvantages that um, radiation is very expensive and so on. So now you have the ultrasound guided. And one of the important things about ultrasound guided liver biopsy is that pain is absolutely absent. In fact, in our hepatology department, when they start looking at this paid liver biopsy trials, they find it so easy now because the patients are all accepting it. They don't mind coming and getting the second liver biopsy done. I feel that it's much safer. And of course, uh, complication rates in terms of bleeding and all is much less because you can actually visualize when there's a bleed and stop the bleed. I think the patient experience is dramatically different between a percutaneous and endoscopic ultrasound guided. There are now many studies, some of which I'll show you, where you've shown the clinical efficacy in terms of the amount of tissue that you get and so on is almost similar. And of course, I think one of the important things is you keep the patient in the department. You don't have to run to the interventional radiology and here and there and so on. So interventional radiology is, can be quite difficult to get at times. and. Usually, most interventional radiologists, when there's a complication, their phones are switched off, very difficult to get them. So therefore, when you have the patient totally in the department, much easier to treat with the complications. So I think um, this is a new modality which is picking up rapidly. In fact, historically, it was Virisima and Michael Levy at Mayo Clinic who did the first US uh, biopsies. At that time, people thought it was just experimental, they're not very sure. Uh, Matthews um, first showed that they could get adequate biopsies because adequacy was very important to require a certain number of portal tracts and all our pathologists want. And of course, this was shown subsequently by Shawas uh, in New York. And then, of course, began the many randomized clinical trials between different techniques of doing this procedure uh, and comparing it with percutaneous techniques. So this has been the timeline. And now I think we are fairly confident of how much material we get and so on. 
So I don't want to go into the technical details of this, but we now know that these two types of needles, which are available, uh, 19 gauge needles, which are available from different companies, are adequate, and they are the ones that have been standardized, and the technique also has been standardized. So we use a 19 gauge needle, and of course the wet suction with heparin, one or two parts are sufficient, and you can actually do both lobes. Normally, uh, there was a criticism that only left lobe could be taken by US guys, and right lobe, we have to go for percussion. That's not true. You can go to any part of the, with the US now flexibility, either transgastric or transduodenal, you can go to any part of the liver and take biopsy. So we can cover whole of the liver now. Uh, we've actually done several studies in our institute looking at both microscopic and macroscopic appearance. And then look at this. This is the US guided ones, and if we compare this with the percutaneous or transjugular, it's almost similar. In fact, again, very good studies comparing the amount of material between these three techniques have been done. And you can see that the length of specimen you get either using EUS or percutaneous is almost similar. It's just that the percutaneous needle is thicker. It's a 16 gauge needle, so you get a little thicker core. But what you require is a portal tracks of about more than 12, and you almost always get it through endoscopic ultrasound. Pathologist is quite happy with this. So I think the adequate specimen that we get. So the tissue yield is similar. Pain is remarkably less with the US. The chance of bleeding also comes down. In fact, one of the biggest problems with percutaneous is when there's a bleed, you don't know it's going into the peritoneal cavity. We haven't assessed it. The cost is slightly higher, but as I just said, our IR guys also are getting costly, so it's not so much different now. So that is regarding liver biopsy. So I believe that the standard of care in 2024, liver biopsy, if you have expertise in your department, should be an US guided liver biopsy, not uh, a percutaneous one. Of course, there are certain situations where you should still do transjugular, but mostly I think you should shift from percutaneous to an US guided one. The second thing, assessment of gastric and esophageal varices, of course, I think the important thing with the US, of course, is you can really assess this varices uh, very well, especially the problem is regarding measurement of uh, portal pressures. We have been using HVPG, which is wedge hepatic versus uh, free hepatic venous pressure, which is a very crude measurement of portal pressure, I think, because we are saying that wedge hepatic is equivalent to the portal vein pressure. So, uh, of course, we depended on this quite a lot because we know that um, this is a good uh, indicator of what is happening in terms of portal pressure. And of course, there are studies showing that the degree of liver disease, the potential chance of bleed, uh, therapeutic monitoring, monitoring with drugs are all done with using this technique of HVPG. But is this really um, the standard? It's an indirect measurement, especially in pre sinusoidal portal hypertension. I don't think it's a good method. You have considerable radiation. <coughs> And I think um, this is, again, an old technique that mentally we have been doing it for long that we should give up. The reason we, we have is that we now can measure these pressures very well with endoscopic ultrasound guidance. In fact, in 24, 2004, the first studies, animal studies were done. And this time, they found surprisingly that even if you put a needle into the portal vein, surprisingly, there's not much of a bleed coming out. Very good correlation with other pressure techniques was found. And the technology has evolved over the last few years. In fact, uh, we now have uh, different types of needle. Ideally, we can use a 22 gauge or 25 gauge. We have this uh, a special type of measurement device, which is now available, not expensive. This can be used to measure the portal pressure. And of course, um, technique is quite simple. And this is uh, my colleague Sandeep doing this. And you can see Vikram also with him, both of them demonstrating this technique. So what is done is measurement of, say, the free right hepatic venous pressure and uh, the portal vein pressure in the intra intrahepatic segment just at the bifurcation. And then you take three measurements, take average of this. This is extremely accurate. In fact, I think this is the true measure of what is happening in the portal vein because you are directly measuring the portal vein pressure. We actually looked at a group of our patients who are going for transplant and what um, we did it just before going for transplant. We did this US guided direct portal vein, not only the intrahepatic, we did a direct portal vein puncture and took pressures. And when they opened up at the time of surgery for transplant, surprisingly, there's no leaks around the portal vein. The portal vein is very resilient. So if you use a 25 gauge needle, you don't produce any hematomas or any tear in the portal vein. It's extremely safe. Of course, we are now doing it in the intrahepatic portal segment. Vikram is here, you know better. But it's a safe procedure. And I think this, in my opinion, to slowly replace the classic transjugular technique, which is very indirect, has radiation, and so on. And again, this is under control of uh, 
the gastroenterologist or the hepatologist to do any number of times he wants to do. And of course, um, this is a Ken Chang study from the first study that was published in 2017. This was almost uh, seven years back where he demonstrated clearly that uh, these pressures very well correlated with the degree of the disease, uh, the chance of bleed, and so on. So a very good correlation. And now we have several other studies suggesting this. So I think uh, US measurement of portal pressure is a good alternative to hepatic venous pressure. Uh, it'll be, I think as we get to the future, it's going to be available more and more to all the units. Glue and coil injections, of course, um, we know that for very cell bleed like this, we have been using uh, glue injection. Traditionally, the, there's a little problem with the glue injection. Although it can be useful in primary practice, chance of embolization is there. First studies, in fact, very long back by Nip Sohendra in this, and actually glue casts were found in these patients. And you can see that there's a potential complication of embolization that can occur in these patients. So Ken Binmola in the US actually started looking at whether we can put coils in these patients, coils with or without glue, to see if they solidify. But this has to be done and under endoscopic ultrasound guidance. And you can see um, there's several advantages of doing this that you can actually directly look at the varices, go to the feeding uh, vessels, and then inject there so you can block, block them completely, the so-called perforator vessels. The technique is quite simple. You go directly from the esophagus into the large and then put coils there. And after we put the coils, we can put the glue. Uh, so glue plus coil, <coughs> Advantage is small amount of glue is sufficient to block the vessel, so embolization does not occur. And there's been uh, a very nice uh, prospective study from Binmola's unit who looked at 151 cases. You see almost 100 long-term follow-up, 93% very cell obliteration. This you cannot achieve with a standard upper J endoscopy, extremely high obliteration. And when you looked at even for primary prophylaxis, uh, again you see very high uh, rates where they're successful. So this gives, comes, this gives us an idea that why not we use this more for even primary prophylaxis because a lot of debate there and Shipsarin's unit has shown that it may be useful, but I think you is extremely safe and very effective. So maybe for primary prophylaxis. And comparing coil with glue has shown that coil is slightly better in terms of uh, embolization. Uh, you can see an example here, a very large uh, fundal varices which, which has been and you can see, you put the Doppler on, you can see the large varics. Again, it's very difficult to accurately assess it from the endoscopic view. But with the US, you can accurately assess this. We put in a coil first, and you can see the coils coming out. There's several diameters, several lengths, and so on. I won't go to the technical details, but once we put a coil, which occupies almost the whole of this one, gets coiled inside. These are angiography coils that uh, the radiologists use. And then we put a small amount of uh, uh, glue inside. So the whole thing gets completely, yeah, see, just 3 ml. Otherwise, you'll have to use about 10 ml for this. So after 3 ml, everything has got solidified completely. And then uh, these viruses slowly shrink in size. We can also look at the perforators. And you can see it's become very hard. And after a certain period of time, this has shrunk. And you can see one of the coils actually coming out here. Uh, so should we do only coils, or should we do only glue, or a combination? And this is a very nice study from Carlos from Ecuador, who showed very clearly that a combination of coil and glue, small quantities, is good enough. This is the best combination. In fact, you can actually totally avoid glue also, because there's some controversies with um, cyanoacrylate. So you can actually give a combination of coil along with thrombin. And this is a very interesting study which showed that when you combine thrombin with coils, you can get the same result of obliteration of the viruses. A decreased bleed, overall decreased lead bleed, and overall decreased reintervention in these patients. In fact, we have done a large multicentric study in our country, Jain Samantha from PJ led this, showing that US guided coil plus glue is safer and much better than using just conventional endoscopic therapy. So I think this, again, is an interesting data to suggest that we should switch our practices from simple glue injection to glue plus coil. Um, for primary prophylaxis, data is scanty, but because we can be so confident now, I would suggest that we start doing trials. And the other thing that we started using in these patients is a hemospray. Conventionally, hemospray was made for arterial bleeds. Uh, Mustafa and uh, Jack David in Brazil actually started using it for variceal bleeds. And initially, for those post variceal branding bleeds, showing that very effective. But very important is very resistant uh, large fundal vessels also responding. And this is another important uh, randomized study they published in gut where they showed clearly 
that when you use, uh, that if patients come to the emergency, traditionally you wait till they stabilize and then do your, say after 12, 24 hours, you do your varicell banding and so on. What they did was they randomized into one group who, who actually had hemospray put in blindly in the emergency and then afterwards uh, did a banding or one group had only banding. You can see clear survival advantage in the hemospray group. So what they believe is that initial phase, if you stop the bleed, ischemia to the organs comes down and these people have actually a survival advantage. So this again is something that should come into our practice, I think, routinely. And of course, we go further, at least in animal studies, we now have the ability to do US-guided uh, photosystemic shunts. In fact, probably we'll replace TIPS or the interventional radiologist TIPS in future because again, this is a very controlled procedure and then anything can be done in the endoscopy unit itself. And again, because we can localize the lesion, especially if you have lesions in the caudate lobe, the radiologist can't tackle this lesion. So if we have a HCC there, I think we are better off as endoscopic ultrasound to target this for either RFA or microwave. And this is such lesion. We published a series recently of difficult lesions which have been treated endoscopic ultrasound guided, and this is Mark Giovannini uh, from France in one of our workshops showing this. So you can localize this very well, and you can say lesions two centimeters or below. Maybe this is the way to go in future in treating these patients and not the conventional radiological or percutaneous technique. And then we come a little into the future. Uh, this is, again, a very hot subject, treating NASH. Uh, we're using this technique. We know that the duodenum is a major metabolic organ, not pancreas. And uh, of course, we can actually interfere with the duodenal mucosa. And we know that in people with type 2 diabetes, those with NASH and so on, experimental and human studies have shown a large amount of neuroendocrine cells. So if we can destroy these cells, probably we can overcome insulin resistance that we see in these patients. A very interesting study that was published by Cummins. These were patients who are basically going for uh, ruined by bypass surgery. They are all hyperglycemic initially, but when ruin one bypass is done and feeding is done, these patients become normal glycemic, see, absolutely normal. And then they got permission from the ethical committees and put in PEG tubes in these patients and started feeding them orally, plus through the PEG tube. You see, some amount of nutrients went through the duodenum, and immediately these patients became hyperglycemic. So the metabolism was completely altered. When they took off the PEG tube feeding, again, they became normal glycemic. So I think this is a very good human study, I don't know how they got the permission, but they got this human study to show that uh, duodenal nutrient passage strongly influences uh, insulin sensitivity and resistance, and duodenum is actually controlling it. So technically, we can now do a duodenal mucosal resurfacing, take off the mucosa and then replace it with the new mucosa. Uh, this is done by now hydrothermal technique, which is very crude. You produce a burn with hot water balloon and so on. But it's getting more and more sophisticated because studies with this have shown a fantastic improvement uh, in both in terms of A1C, but also you can see ALT, AST, and so on. And all the metabolic parameters seem to improve with this. So now the three other techniques using uh, the duodenal mucosal resurfacing, but using more sophisticated <coughs> technique, laser and so on. In fact, uh, uh, this is a technique by Barham from Mayo where he's using electroporation device electroporation device goes and sits around the duodenum and using electroporation current, which is a very sophisticated way of burning the duodenal mucosa very safely, you can actually resurface the whole duodenal mucosa. It's very rapid reepithelation that occurs after that in very safe procedure. And in fact, uh, you can do the whole procedure in 30 minutes. Second, third, and fourth part of the duodenum can be completely resurfaced in about 30 minutes. It's called the reset device. But very interesting, there are two studies now, one from Amsterdam and one from Barham, who showed clearly that in patients who are requiring insulin, 100% required, after the resurfacing, only 14% required insulin, showing that you are actually changing the whole metabolic. So what happens to liver in these patients is very interesting. You can see baseline fat by MRI techniques from 23% to 2.8%, so you can actually take out. So the whole metabolic reset occurs with this. And another new device that's coming up is VK Sharma is in US again. This is a very interesting device, which is like an umbrella. In between, steam is put in, and this again, very uniformly ablates, simple device, uniformly ablates the duodenal mucosa, resurfacing it. So I think these are all new devices which have shown that mostly as an endoscopist, we can treat now um, patients with NASH in a more um, science-based way. Obese NASH is balloon plus gastroplasty DMR and lean NASH is only with DMR because they're interfering with the sensitivity. 
So endopathology, I show you all the data, very small amount of because a huge field that there's feasibility now, safety and efficacy is there. And in future, I think it's going to become the standard of care for many of these uh, patients. So this is, I think, one stop shop for all patients with liver disease. And I think it's going to become an integral part of many of the gastroenterology department. And if you want to see some of the procedures with the permission of the chair, I invite you to our meeting next month. Thank you very much. Nagi, fantastic. Really good job. I have just one question about the uh, portal pressure yeah. studies. Yeah. Do you give anesthesia? And because the anesthesia will have an effect on the portal yeah. pressures. So that's, so yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, the problem is the advantage of US is the patient doesn't do anything. And the only way you do it is with using propofol. Now, what effect propofol has on portal pressures, we don't know because you can't do without anesthesia and with anesthesia. Uh, we have to, but what happens is we define all our portal pressures now in patients who are already on propofol and then it becomes uniform. Okay. So this gold standard yeah. also yeah. is in propofol, yeah. Normals yeah. also are yeah. in propofol. Yeah, but this is two different techniques. So is there any randomized studies to show that they are equally good or just as, as good as the other one? Yeah, so there's been no randomized, but the prospective studies we looked at data which have shown that these are good enough with more safety for the US procedure. But there is one large randomized study being done comparing uh, uh, these two techniques. So we'll probably know the result in about a year's time now. Uh, sir, as regards to the glue and coil is conceded yeah. with the fundal varices, which is normally there, yeah. most of the procedures have shown that after some time, yeah. the coil is seen coming out of the yes, varices. Yes. So do you think that we really need to advocate that only or only glue will do better? No, the problem with only glue is that, with that, that study which I showed you, the randomized study, we showed that if you use glue and coil, only glue, one, uh, the increased incidence of embolization. You may not have clinical embolization, but actually nearly 30% of the patients have emboli in the lung. That is one. Number two, if you look at re-intervention rates and re-bleeds rates, little higher with glue alone compared to glue and coil. So I think now it's glue and coil. But very interesting, this thrombin study has shown that there's something safer also available. So thrombin and coil may be the standard of care in future. Yeah. So secondly, sir, you were initially giving us, you know, the insights which in your talks were there about the duodenal sleeve. Yes. But yes, with yes. the electrodation, that will be taken off and I think this would be much a simpler procedure. Then? It's simpler, but uh, the problem is you are destroying the mucosa. So some people don't like it. So with the, with, uh, the sleeve, what happens is you get dramatic responses within that period. After you remove the sleeve, there's a potential chance. So what we're thinking is we can do behavioral modification. So you put a sleeve, patient's behavioral modification, so that then, of course, they don't go back to their old habits. So that changes there. Questions from the house. You know, this is a, you have to be, is a pro problem is there is a have to be a pathologist yes. and an endoscopist. And so, this combination yeah. <laughs> of endoscopy ultrasound yeah. technique yeah. and it being a hepatologist yeah. is probably very rare. Uh, no, I think Jang, we are all trained by you to be hepatologists and endoscopists long back also. But yeah. now what is happening is all the youngsters now in gastroenterology are all getting trained in US, well trained in US. So this has become like what we are trained in upper GI colon and all, they are all getting trained. So I think it's not uh, something which is out of the way. It's, it's in the track only. Vikram, that, any comment yeah, Vik on that? Vikram about he's the, training? Yeah. He's the real hepatologist and endoscopic ultrasound yeah. expert. expert. I'm in, a, I'm in a teaching hospital. Most fellows are introduced to the concept of EOS. Obviously, uh, I, I wish they would spend more time in the diagnostic part before jumping on to interventions. So there is also, a, unfortunately, a problem of taking shortcuts and uh, watching YouTubes and going on to advanced procedures. But yes, there is a huge enthusiasm. And uh, manpower is definitely not lacking. Learning is easy. Resources are available in, in India, at least. So we are, as yeah. Sir says, on the right track here. How many endoscopists are starting doing endoscopy know about the endoscopy ultrasound to that extent 
that they can investigate liver. Yeah, so I think right, currently we have uh, 350 DM, DNB programs in the country. So every year so many people are coming out. I would say that at least 70% of them are being trained in basic US. Oh, basic. Uh, the basic US. Yeah. Now, whether they develop to like what um, Vikram is saying, that uh, it's very important that they actually work a little more on diagnostic US and not. Because what happens is it's very easy to do a cystogastrostomy, US cystogastrostomy, and so on. So they get tempted into going into this because also it's got a huge commercial value. So people don't want to spend too much time. But I think they, all of them are thought basic U.S. All, we have so many U.S. courses throughout the year, throughout the country. I would say that at least 70 percent, which means about 200 people are coming out every year in this country learning basic endoscopic ultrasound. Any questions from audience? This hmm? one. I think uh, Jayanta is there. Eh? Uh, sir, really nice yeah. presentation. I'm Samadri from Ames. Uh, so, uh, what do you think, sir, about assessing hemodynamics non-invasively uh, instead of putting in a needle directly into the portal vein? Yeah. Uh, because we get a lot of rich data from the isigus vein, the aorta, and yeah. a lot of collaterals are also seen. So, uh, do you think it could potentially replace HVPG at some point of time? I don't know. Actually, I'm not um, into this field at all. So, maybe Patrick or somebody can answer this. I my knowledge is that uh, to get a very accurate assessment, you have to actually measure the pressure in the portal vein. Uh, if you don't do that, there can be indirect measurements. In fact, there are many indirect, even with a simple ultrasound scan, you can estimate what is the portal pressure. We are now estimating the pancreatic ductal pressure just using MRCP and so on, but I think these are very indirect. I don't know whether we can base our further therapies on that, Patrick. I, I agree with Nagi, we should measure the pressure because we tried with MR where you can get flow and pressure is very complicated, it's flow times resistance. So when you get flow, and again flow is arterial flow and portal venous flow, then you have to get intrahepatic resistance. The whole thing is very complicated. So if you can do pressure measurement safely, which you have yeah, shown, yeah. I think that is the standard. The follow-up of Dr. Dilavri's question is, we need a standard now that on US guided, the normal pressure is this much. On HVPG, yeah. we say it's five and below, six and above is port lap tension, clinically significant and whatever. We need those same standards for EOS, which will routinely be done under propofol. So I think those standards are still being worked on. So we're not ready as yet to say, this is normal. Yeah. We know a little difference, but we need much more. So we have, yeah. Yep. Yes. yeah. Uh, in extension to the last two comments by Dr. Patrick Kamath and the other person, so uh, we, I think we do not need a one is to one correlation. We need no. the endpoints, say no. presence of portal hypertension, clinically significant portal hypertension, a 12 millimeter, 16 millimeter, 20 millimeter, the HVPG landmarks which correlate with, we already know they correlate with no. clinical endpoints. And I think we are there, as has been mentioned, the azygous vein, the hepatic vein, waveform, all of this information is available in radiology literature for us, and they have correlated. The liver ecotexture, hepatic vein, arrival time, and so on and so forth. So uh, I can rattle out around 10, 10 non-invasive, if not more, markers, which correlate with these clinically significant cutoffs. May not have one is to one correlation, but if you do that, you know your patient has clinically significant portal hypertension, high risk of dying and other uh, significant endpoints. So this literature is available in radiology. We just have to learn to extrapolate it and do it well on US. Yeah. But I think we have to redefine our gold standards now. I would, I, if US becomes so easy and portal vein uh, is very resilient, it doesn't get uh, ruptured easily. So if we, if we redefine our gold standard, then maybe that becomes the gold standard and not uh, HPVG that we do conventionally. Basically, uh, the main advantage sir, is uh, for the even the low platelets and yeah, high can. INR, you know, yeah. both of them would be safer by in US system rather than the trans yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, No other questions, I think, you know, it had been a nice interactive session. We can wind up for the day.